Why do you want what you want? You ever ask yourself that question? Why do you want the house that you want? Why do you want to live in the neighborhood that you want? Why do you want the car that you want? Why do you want that job, those career goals? Why do you want to be like that person? Why do you want to be friends with that person? Why do you want to date that person? Why do you want a divorce? Why do you want what you want? If you look around today at all of pop culture's various experts, you get the same answer across the board. Your wants are what are true inside of yourself. Your wants are a self-expression. You want whatever starts in your heart and that emanates outwards. But is that true? Do you think that your wants come from the inside out? In 1972, there was a straight-laced, totally ordinary freshman at Reed College in Oregon. And like many freshmen, he needed some money. And so he decided that he was going to sell his IBM Selectrix typewriter. And he decided he's going to sell it to a fellow student, a guy named Robert Friedland. Now, he never met Robert Friedland before, but he shows up at Friedland's apartment at the appointed time and he knocks on the door. No answer. So he tries again, he knocks on the door again. No answer, he knocks again, no answer. And so he decides he'll check the door handle and sure enough, the door is open. So he opens up the door, he peeks his head in and what he sees horrifies him. Robert Friedland is sitting in the middle of an empty room clad only in underwear, meditating. And he's so frightened by what's happened, he's kind of embarrassed, he tries to get out, but Robert Friedland says, no man, come on in, come on in. So he goes in. And as it turns out, this freshman ended up becoming friends with Robert Friedland. And Robert Friedland was an interesting character. He went to school in Maine before Oregon, but he was kicked out of his school for possessing $125,000 worth of LSD. After that, he came to Reed College because he wanted to be the student body president. And when he graduated, he planned to go to India to find a guru. Robert Friedland was skeptical of Western medicine. He had strange bathing habits. He dressed strangely. He only washed his feet in the toilet. The thing that was most important about Robert Friedland was his personality. He was charismatic. He was dictatorial. He was mercurial. And he was mesmerizing. Everybody who was around Robert Friedland was just drawn to Robert Friedland. And this freshman was no exception. And over time, the freshman found that he began to want all the things that Robert Friedland had. He began to want all the things that Robert Friedland wanted. And suddenly, the the freshman, he began to dress a little strangely. He began to become a little bit skeptical of Western medicine. He dropped out of school to go to India to find a guru. He, 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 He became, in his personality, charismatic, dictatorial, mercurial, and very mesmerizing, so much so that his future coworkers would often say about him that everywhere he went, he created a reality distortion field. The freshman was Steve Jobs, the founder of Apple. And if you fast forward 40 years from when Steve Jobs met Robert Friedland, you'd meet a different person. Her name was Elizabeth Holmes. And at the age of 19, she founded a medical company, Theranos, that was able to do rapid blood testing. And Elizabeth Holmes, she modeled her whole life after Steve Jobs. She wanted what Steve Jobs had. She wanted what Steve Jobs wanted, so much so that she began to wear his signature outfit, the black turtleneck with the blue jeans. She put on blue contact lenses so that she would look like him. She deepened her voice so that she would sound more like him. But most importantly was the personality She was charismatic, she was dictatorial, she was mercurial, she was mesmerizing, so much so that venture capitalists said, I wanna have a piece of what she has. I need to invest in Theranos so that I can get a piece of it. And so they began to invest. And then when other investors saw their friends investing, they wanted the same thing. And over time, her company became valued at $14 billion, billion dollars at its peak. There's just one problem, it was a fake. It was a sham. The technology didn't exist. Elizabeth Holmes fleeced all of her investors. Now, when we tell the story of people like Steve Jobs, we never tell the story this way, do we? We tell the story like this. Steve Jobs was a visionary. He wanted things that no one else wanted. He thought different. He wanted different. And that's why he created a technology company that could change the world. But now you know the truth. Steve Jobs just wanted to be Robert Friedland. Elizabeth Holmes just wanted to be Steve Jobs. 
and the venture capitalists just wanted what Elizabeth Holmes had, and their friends just wanted what they had. As it turns out, for decades on decades, they were in this contagious loop of desire, one person's desire infecting the next person's desire, one person's wants infecting the next person's wants. What about you? Why do you want what you want? Do your wants really come from the inside out? Or is the truth that we're all stuck in these cycles of desire and what we want is derivative? Your desire is derivative. The desires of others are contagious and you catch them just as easily as anybody else does. I mean, again, what do you want right now? Do you want anything, anything that you haven't seen someone else have? Do you want anything that you haven't seen, whether it's locally or nationally or someone else, someone else model and want? What if desires are derivative? Everyone from sociologists to neuroscientists all agree humans are highly imitative creatures, much more so than any other animal species on the planet. We are highly imitative creatures. Our desires are derivative. They come from other people. And there is no way for any of us, not Steve Jobs, not Elizabeth Holmes, not you and me, there's not a way for any of us to escape from these cycles of contagious desire. Uh, there's, again, plenty of gurus who say they know the secret. They'll tell you how. You just read my book and you'll get the secret. But you know what happens every time you read one of those books? You just become like them. <laughs> That's all that happens. They can't get you out. They just give you a different model. That's what I love about Psalm 73. Psalm 73 was written by a guy named Asaph. And Asaph understood that we all live in this cycle of desire. And there is no escaping it. He's incredibly honest. There's no way out. But what he saw was that on the one hand, that cycle of desire, of desire can be destructive. It can ruin and wreck your life. But on the other hand, God in his grace and his power can enter into that cycle and transform your life and renew your life. So let's look at the negative side first. He opens up Psalm 73 like this. Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But, 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 as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold, for I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. This is poetry. And like most poetry, to understand it, you have to think about it, you have to meditate upon it. And in the second verse, He's saying that his life was almost wrecked. His life was almost ruined. And to show this, he uses a metaphor. He imagines someone climbing up a steep rock face. And he imagines that as you're climbing, you, you lose your foothold. You lose your grip. And what happens if this guy loses his foothold? He crashes down. He dies. He's destroyed. But in the metaphor, it's not a slippery rock or a crumbling rock that leads to the man's destruction. That's not it at all. Look at what he says. How did he almost slip? For, here's why, I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Now, you might think that the problem here is envy, and envy is a problem, but it's not what the author is focused on. Look at what he repeats, the arrogant and the wicked. He's saying, we're all caught up in a cycle of desire, and if you pick the wrong models, you'll desire the wrong things, which will lead to your own destruction. And he's saying, in my life, my model was the arrogant, was the wicked. I began to want what they wanted, and that's what led to my near destruction. Why do you want what you want? Who are your models? There's really two different kinds of models in the world, probably more than two, but at least two. Role models and peers. And I know this isn't rocket science, right? But it's true, we, there's two different kinds, role models and Pierre, so let's talk about role models because it's by far the simpler one. We all have role models. It might be our manager or the CEO at our business or someone in our life who we look up to. And if you have a role model, you know how it goes. Slowly over time, you begin to want what they have. You begin to want what they want. You think, gosh, I'd like to have his job. Gosh, I'd like to drive her car. Gosh, I'd like to have that salary. Gosh, I'd like to live in that neighborhood. Gosh, I'd like to have his intelligence. Gosh, I'd like to have her charisma. Gosh, I'd like to have his friends. Gosh, I'd like to see the world the way they do, have their values. It's not just those kinds of people who become our role models. Celebrities, social media influencers, big name people, authors, writers, podcasters, they can become our models just as easily. And again, as you're watching them, they feel so intimate because they're right there on their phone and they're talking to you. But the truth is, they're not that intimate, but their desires, you begin to catch them. They're contagious. And all of a sudden you think, man, I want her body. 
Man, I want that house. I want that house project. Man, I want her values. I want to fight for justice the way she does. I, I, I want to think the way she does. I want her gender. I want her sex. I want her whatever it is. I want what she has because desires are contagious. And role models are some of the most contagious people out there. Who are your role models right now? Are they helping you to want the right things in your life? Uh, about a year into the pandemic, after a lot of people were kind of beginning to go back to work, I was talking to an educator who reached out to me because she said that she was afraid that she was losing her faith. So we got together and I asked her what was going on and she told me that she'd just begun to ask a lot of questions and she couldn't find answers to her questions anywhere. She questioned what God said about sex and sexuality. She questioned whether Jesus really was God. She questioned whether the Bible was trustworthy and reliable. So I asked her, I said, you're looking for answers. Where are you looking? She goes, well, I, I mean, I guess I've just read a few articles, but, but really they all just disagree with Christianity. And I go, okay, well, who are you talking to? And she says, well, I mean, during the pandemic, I was so isolated. I mean, it's really, I was just taking in a lot of content from influencers on my phone. But then when I went back to work, I obviously had my peers, but I'm really close with my principal at my school. And so, you know, I really look up to her. And so, and so, so that's a big thing. And so she had a lot of influence. And I said, okay, well, those influencers, that principal, what were they telling you? And she says, well, they all think that Christianity is stupid. They all think that Christianity is nonsense. It's dumb. It's untrue. It's unjust. It's unreliable. So I looked at her and I said, are you sure that you want to leave your faith behind? Or is it just that you want what they want? You want what they have. You want to have their worldview, their values, their way of seeing the world, their way of being in the world. Who are your role models right now? There is nothing more deadly than a role model that trains you to want greed over generosity, anger over kindness, hustle over Sabbath. Who are your models right now? And what are they training you to want? Do you know the answer to that question? Because they're there. Of course, it's not just role models. Those aren't the only models. We also have peers. And peers are perhaps even more important than our role models. And sometimes with our peers, it's the exact same thing. We just mimic them. We want what they want. Same thing as with the role models. But more often than not, our, our peers shape us in a slightly different way. You see, if you want the same thing that your peer wants, what ends up happening well, a rivalry, right? If you want the same thing, you often end up in a rivalry. It might be quiet, they may have no idea, but you often end up in a rivalry with that person where you want the same thing, but you have to beat them out, where you want the same thing, but you want to distinguish yourself and be different than them. I mean, we all experience this, right? Like, let's say you want a Tesla, and you get together with a friend, and your friend's like, hey, I got a Tesla. You don't get all happy in your heart. Like, that is awesome, man. That is so good for you. I'm so happy for your Tesla. You might smile, but inside you're thinking, you don't deserve a Tesla. You can't afford a Tesla. I know how much money you make. Your car payment has to be insane. There's no way that you can be doing that right now. You know what? One day I'm gonna drive a luxury vehicle too. And when I do it, I'm not gonna have a stupid car loan like you do. And it's not gonna be a Tesla because that car's stupid anyways. We've all been there, right? We've all, we've all felt that before. And that's because this is how it often works with our peers. If you want to know which peers are most shaping your desires, look at your rivals. They're the ones you will want what they want. It won't even be about what they want, or whatever the thing is, you will want what they want. Uh, Asaph, he described this perfectly, the way that we want what people want and it turns into this rivalrous desire. He said, remember, he wants what the wicked and the arrogant have. I mean, this is why, he says, for they have no pangs until death. Their bodies are fat and sleek. They're not in trouble as others are. They're not stricken like the rest of mankind. He wants what they have, right? That's what he's saying. But then watch how quickly he switches over into being rivals, into mocking this person. He goes, their eyes swell out through fatness. Now, I know fat eyes isn't really an insult anymore, but back in the day, I mean, he's, like, he's like, yeah, I want what you want, fat eyes. And that's exactly where this thing is going because this person has become his rival and it's so raw and real because that's exactly what we do when we get in one of these contagious desire feedback loops with a peer who becomes a rival. Who are your peers that you model after? Who are the peers whose desires you are catching? Who are the peers who are your rivals? 
Again, I remember this guy, he, he, he's a friend of mine, and he went to college with a peer. And in college, him and this friend, they had the same major. They, they progressed along forward. They got a similar job out of college. And their careers progressed kind of at the same pace. And so my friend is at lunch with his peer, and his peer says to him, hey, guess what? I got a $20,000 raise. My friend's like, whoa, that's crazy. How'd that happen? He said, well, to be honest, I changed jobs and I lied on my resume and said I made more money in my current job than I actually make, and so they had to match the price that I laid down. And inside, my friend was incensed. You know, how dare you? How could you go lie? This is, this is awful. But as he's casting moral aspersions on his peer, the truth is he's not really morally offended. He's just jealous. <laughs> All of a sudden, he wants what his friend has. I mean, this guy, my friend, he was content in his job. He was happy in his job. But all of a sudden, for the next year, the only thing he could talk about was, man, I need a pay raise. Man, they underpay me here. Man, I gotta make more money. That's all that he could care about. And he got frustrated because he thought being a Christian and following God's ways, that was putting a roadblock up in front of him so that he couldn't get what he wanted. He felt a lot like Asaph. He wrote this when he was wanting all the things that the wicked and the arrogant had. He said, all in vain, have I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence? You see the point, right? It's no use. Don't bother living a pure life. What good is it? And this is what my friend felt when he wanted what the wicked and the arrogant had. But finally, after a year, he got what he wanted. He got the $20,000 pay raise. All he had to do was apply for a new job and lie on his resume. You see, this is how it always works. This is why Asaph's warnings are so dire. We don't have wants that come from the inside out so much as wants that come from the outside in. And if you model the wrong person, if the wrong person becomes your model, you will catch what they want. You will want what they want and it will transform your life. And if your models are not helping you to want the right things, it will lead to destruction. It will put you at enmity with the living God. Asaph says this about himself when he was wanting the wrong things. He said, when my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in heart, I was brutish and ignorant. I was like a beast towards you. If you have the wrong models, they're going to train you to want what they want and they will want the wrong things. And I can promise you this, they will not want Jesus and it will set you at odds with him. So why do you want what you want? Why do you want that house, that car, that salary, that lifestyle, that boyfriend, that girlfriend, that marriage, that divorce? Why do you want those values, that way of being in the world? Why do you want what you want? Who are your models? Who are your peers? Who are your rivals? Who are your role models? Desire is contagious. We're all living in the feedback loop. And Asaph's point with this entire psalm is actually pretty straightforward, pretty simple. He's saying, look, you cannot escape this loop, this unending loop of desires. However, God can enter into it. God can enter into it and restore it and renew it. And he tells us the secret to allowing that to happen in your life. He explains it in the, in the next verse. He says, but when I thought how to understand this, he's trying to understand why is it that I'm catching the desires of all these people who are far from God, when I tried to understand it, it seemed to me to be a wearisome task until, what does he do? Until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I discerned the wicked's ends. Now, it's easy for us to miss what he's saying here because we're modern people, but an ancient person would not miss what Asaph is saying. He tells us exactly how he broke that cycle of desire and started a new cycle of desire. How he did it, he went to the sanctuary of God. Now, this is in some like mental fortress or imaginary place when he closes his eyes. The sanctuary of God was a real life physical place. It was the temple. It was the first temple. And think about what happens when he went to the temple. Why is it that when he goes to the temple, all of a sudden his desires start changing? Well, first and foremost, there were priests there. And the priests, they, they, they oversaw worship. They led the people in song and praise and prayer. They taught the Torah. They, they oversaw all of the sacrifices. But that's not all. It was filled with people, people who were worshiping God, who were praising him, who were praying to him, who were saying, God, we love you, we want you, we want our lives to be shaped by you. In other words, when Asaph went into the sanctuary of God, he was surrounded by models, by role models and by peers 
who helped him to want the right things, who helped him to want love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control, but most importantly, helped him to want the most important thing of all, Jesus, God. Who are your role models? Who are your peers? Are they helping you to want the right things? It's only in the sanctuary, in the temple, in this place that Asaph can write this. He says this in Psalm 73. Nevertheless, I am continually continually with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. And afterward, you will receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on the earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. See, it's only when he's in the temple, in the presence of these people, that he starts to want the right things. Does this describe you? Do you want God more than anything in heaven or anything on earth? Do you want him to take your right hand and guide you in his counsel and train you to walk in his ways? Do you delight in him more than anything else? Is he your portion forever? If we're gonna be honest, the answer is often no. Why? Because we have the wrong models. Because we've caught the wrong desires. Do you realize that this room is a gift from God to you? You are not in this church by accident. God has put you here for a reason. He has models for you here to catch their desires so that you will love him and want him more and more and more. As a pastor, I have seen nothing, 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 nothing destroy more people's faiths than the pandemic. It wasn't just a disease that they were catching. They were catching desires. And as we were isolated from each other, as we chose to be isolated from each other, as we had to be in all these different contexts, all of a sudden, we weren't here. We weren't in the place with the, with the models that we needed to help us to desire the right things. And so we found different models instead. And so those models, the wicked and the arrogant, they began to shape what it is that we want, what it is that we live for, what it is that we think. Just ask yourself, who are your role models right now since the pandemic? Are your role models the Christian businessmen and businesswomen who conduct their affairs with honesty and, and integrity? Are they the, the, the small group leaders, the teachers, the pastors that God has put you under, that God has brought you into this congregation with? Is that who your role models are that will help you want the right things? Or have you envied the wicked and the arrogant? Be careful, your foot may slip. Have you become cynical? Cynical about leaders, cynical about Christian leaders, cynical about anything around your faith because you had the wrong models in your life? Who are your peers? Are your peers your friends here at church, the people in your small group? Are your peers the Christians that you work alongside or in the neighborhood? Or are the peers that you're modeling your life after the wicked and the arrogant, people who are far from God, people who will never want Jesus and will never help you to want Jesus? Have you become cynical about Christians? You become cynical about Christians who are a gift from God so that you would know him more and love him more. Asaph said, I went into the sanctuary and that's, that's when I started to want God. When you walk into this building, no, it is not an accident. These people I've been brought here for you and you for them as a gift so that you would want the right things. If you're like me and everybody else out here, there are models we have that we shouldn't have. And the good news is God is merciful. God is forgiving. When Asaph says, I'm about to slip, I'm about to fall, he says, God reaches down with his right hand and he pulls me up and guides me in his counsel. God has not let you go. He has brought you here for a reason. This is not an accident. Turn to him and say, God, give me the right models in my life so that I would long for you, so that I would know you. Thank you for the gift of grace that are my friends, that are the people in this church, in this body. Thank you for that, and may they shape my longings, not the wicked, not the arrogant. This is part of why we take communion. You see, it's easy in the midst of communion to just kind of go through the motions, you know? It doesn't really mean much of anything. 
But the truth is when we take communion, it's a way that we remind ourselves that we are two things. One, united to Jesus. When you take his body and his blood, you're saying, Jesus, I want you to be my most model of all models. I want to model my life after you. I want to want what you want. I want to want you more than anything else. The second thing it does, why we take it together, is it unites us with one another. It's a way of looking around you and saying, I am not here by accident. God has put me here for a reason. I have been united with the people that I am sitting around right now so that their desires would infect me, so that my desires for God would infect them. That's what communion's all about. On the night that Jesus died, he took a loaf of bread and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and he said, every time you eat this bread, do so in remembrance of me. The bread that we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. Will you say this with me? We are one body and we share one bread. Take and eat. You are one body, you share one bread. Let that infect you, the longing and love of Jesus and the person right next to you. Let that drive your desires. Pick the right models. That's why Jesus gathered together all of his disciples and he looked at him and he poured out wine into a cup and he said, this is the blood of the new covenant spilled for the forgiveness of sins. Every time you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. The cup that we share, the cup that we share together unites us as brothers and sisters in Christ. We have died together, we will rise together, we will live together. Take and drink. You are not here by accident. The people who are sitting next to you, you will die with them, you will rise with them, and you will spend eternity in an unending feedback loop of right desire, where their love for Jesus will infect you so that you can love Jesus, so that you can infect them, so that we can all love Jesus more. You are not here by accident. Do not let cynicism wreck your life. Do not turn from the living God to follow models who have no idea what they're doing. Thank God for the gift of this room. Thank God for the gift of this place, for the people he's surrounded you with so that you would know him, so that you would love him, so that you would want him more than anything else.